This video is just one in a series of videos that show how to use Oracle Apex Application Express version 5 to build a prototype application based on a database in Oracle XE. There are earlier versions of this video series for previous versions of Apex. You can work along with the videos by getting the scripts that are used in the first few videos. And the scripts are available at the URL shown, which is case sensitive. So if it has capital D, you need to enter capital D. Your alternative is you can go to the second link and use the contact page to request that the scripts be emailed to you. If you have the scripts, you can work along with the videos. I'm going to log in as Carlo, who is the designer on this project, who's responsible for building the project's table. So I'll log in as Carlo. And I'll go to the object browser. And we've had several tables created through scripts and populated with data. But if we were to build the projects table from scratch, just to give you an idea of how you could actually build a table, we could come over here to the right side and select a table. And I can't actually create projects, so I'm going to call it projects uh, new. And I would type in proj ID and select a numeric data type because this would be what's referred to as a surrogate key where we allow the sequence and trigger for this table to generate unique values anytime a unique value anytime a row is added to the table and so we can go ahead and do a precision of 6 and then I could do proj name and select variable character and set a field size changing this up just a little bit. It doesn't really matter because we're going to cancel out of this but just to show you how this would work uh, so I could uh, create my fields, define the data type set the field size, if it's numeric, set precision and scale, and then go ahead um, and click Next. And this would, of course, have a primary key. There's no reason to build a table without one. And it'll be populated by, in our case, let's pretend that it's going to be uh, populated by a new sequence. And Apex will create that for you. So it takes the name of the table and adds PK at the end. Then you need to sec select which field will serve as the primary key and click Next. And if there are any foreign keys that we wanted to create, we could do those here. We could also do those later after the table has been created. So I'll go ahead and click Next. And if we had any other constraints that we wanted to put into place right now. We could put those here. However, we can also do the constraints after the table has been created. And then I would click Create Table. I'm not going to do that here. And one of the reasons I create the projects table with the scripts is because the next step would be to import data into the projects table and I did it with a script for anybody working on the videos so that I would know for certain the field names and could make the import successful. So I'm actually going to go ahead and click cancel here but that would show you how to build a table. Uh, I also before I go in and import data I want to show how you would set a constraint. So in the students table, 
we have a surrogate key student ID that is system generated. The unique value each time we add a record is created with a combination of a sequence and a trigger. But we also have student user ID and I want this to be unique. So think of it as something like, you know, if it's Bill Smith, then his student ID might be B. Smith. Uh, if it's Carlos Vargas, then it might be C. Vargas. So what I want to do is come up here to Constraints. And we see existing constraints that are put into place when the script ran to build the table and set the primary key, the foreign key, and some check constraints. In other words, fields that in this case cannot be null, which means you must populate them when you add a new record. Let's add another constraint by clicking Create. And I don't really like their default naming so standard, so I would do students and then unique, and then um, student ID, something like that, or maybe user ID. You do have a maximum of 29 characters. Uh, the types of constraints, I want this to be unique, and once I've selected the constraint type, then I say which one, and it's student user ID, and go ahead and click Next, and Finish. So I've added this uniqueness constraint on student user ID. If I come back to the table and see how the columns are set up, uh, actually let's look at the data. What I wanted to do was ensure that nobody uses the same student user ID. So if we had a Bill Smith and a Bob Smith, only one of them can use B Smith. The other one has to come up with another variation. We've all encountered this when we have to create user IDs. But that shows you how you could quickly add a constraint to a table. So I'm logged in as Carlos still and I want to do another thing which is import data into the projects table. So in the scripts that you were provided with there is a file called projects and that has projects data in it. You could click on it and see what's inside. So it has a project name and the name of the client. So what we're going to do is go to SQL Workshop and go to Utilities and select Data Workshop. And we want to import data, so I'll select in this case text data. And it's an existing table. And we want to upload a file. It's comma separated in our case. So we click Next. And it asks uh, for the, the schema name or the table owner, and that's by default what shows up, so you don't need to change it. But now I need to find projects and select that. Then I need to go choose the file, and that'll be projects data. Now it's very hard to see this, but there is a separator of a comma. I could uh, indicate something else, but the separator by default is comma, which is correct optionally enclosed by. If you look at that field or look at the data in that file you'll see that the, the fields are also delimited by double quotes when the data is uh, alphanumeric which is the case for both fields. So what I want to do actually is come in here and type in a double quote. If I do that it the import will strip out those double quotes. If I don't put that here then the double quotes will come in as part of the project name and part of the team name. And there is no first row with column names. So I uncheck that and I click Next. Now the next thing we do is there's no, in the data file that we're importing, there's no column name to indicate where the data goes. So I need to match it up. And I see example data here. I am going to select project name and then I'm going to select client name. And then I'm ready to load the data. And it says six succeeded. 
zero failed. But we'll just double check that by going back to SQL Workshop, Object Browser, and looking in Projects. Now once again, I didn't actually show this table to show that there was no data, but now we do have the data that was in that file. So as an alternative, you're not necessarily going to have data handed to you in a script format with SQL commands, but you might have it in something like a spreadsheet or a comma delimited file, and this would be how you could import the data. In the next video, we'll look at a very nice feature in Apex that will generate a reference table or a lookup table for us based on an existing column in a table.